welcome to another Negrom seminar. And today we have Dr. Honhu Liu from Virginia Tech, and he will talk about Galerkin approximations of nonlinear delay differential equations, convergence analysis, and applications. Floor is yours, Dr. Liu. Thank you, Vijay. I'd so like to thank uh, the, all, all the organizers, uh, Trian, Francisco, and Maria, uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to present uh, this work. Uh, yeah, so, um, I'll be talking about the um, delay differential equations. Um, so um, it's a, we have a, a new way to uh, um, derive uh, ordinary differential equation approximations to it, and we'll see a little bit about the, uh, some um, applications uh, that we can use for this uh, ODE approximations of it. Uh, uh, it's a, a work, um, so it's kind of an ongoing stretch back to uh, a few years back uh, as uh, we were talking <laughs> before um, the uh, seminar. Uh, the, uh, it's a joint work with uh, Mikasha Kroon from UCLA and Weizmann Institute and uh, Michael Gale from Economo Supera and uh, uh, Yilan Koren, uh, Huan Liu from Weizmann Institute and also Xu Hong Wang from Indiana University. Um, so uh, when I first uh, uh, get exposed to uh, this topic, delayed differential equations, it was when I was a, a, a postdoc at UCLA and uh, honestly, I didn't know much about DDEs at the time. We learned a lot uh, about ODEs and PDEs, right? But uh, uh, for some reason, uh, not too much about DDEs. So I, I thought I'll, I'll start with a short introduction of DDEs. Um, uh, then I will introduce uh, the approximation schemes. Uh, uh, it's based on our new type. Well, I should not say new. Uh, um, uh, um, a particular type of uh, poly orthogonal polynomials. Uh, we introduced the polynomials and uh, also talk about the, the um, uh, a little bit about convergence analysis. Uh, then to illustrate uh, on some numerical examples. Um, then uh, I'll talk about uh, some potential applications uh, of these Galerkin approximations in the context of. Uh, Bifurcation analysis and also uh, a little bit um, noise driven chaos. Um, so, oops, I'm sorry. So I guess I clicked on the wrong, so it goes all the way back. So, here we go, times is another very fast. Uh, um, sliding back, so the um, introduction to DDEs. Uh, so there are many types of delayed differential equations. Right? See, so, um, the simplest, uh, or arguably the simplest, is uh, the ones with the constant delays. So the run side uh, depends on the current state, but also on a couple of uh, previous states at uh, some choosing uh, lag time tau one all the way to tau k. So these are um, positive uh, constant delays. Um, some examples, for instance, the right equation, also known as uh, the Hutchinson's equation from um, mass biology, um, and also the suarez shop equation uh, coming from uh, atmospheric dynamics. So people were using that as a, 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 a symphonistic representation of um, modeling of uh, the El Nino uh, Southern Oscillation. Uh, then there's uh, the delay uh, with uh, distributed delay, meaning that uh, so the was uh, involves an integral uh, of the state uh, um, over some history segment. Um, like um, an example would be the model of uh, epidemics, uh, where I is the infected population. If we don't uh, include the term, the second term over here, it's just a logistic type of equation. Um, and when you look at the term over here, it's like the logistic term, but uh, uh, involving an integral, it's like we consider uh, yeah, the infected um, populations over a history, uh, over a interval from the history. Uh, um, and also there are more exotic ones, uh, like the delay itself depend on the state um, of X itself. And of course, there's also a system of the DDEs and the neutral delay differential equations, meaning that um, the derivative of X itself involves delay in it and also a delay partial differential equations. Right. So um, then what's so special about this uh, DDEs? 
compared to, um, for instance, ordinary differential equations, is that delayed differential equation, it's uh, actually infinite dimensional when we think about it from a dynamic system point of view, because it requires a segment of the history uh, to initiate uh, the um, system, right? Not just at one particular time instant. Um, so because of that, even just a scalar delay differential equation, it can support complicated dynamics. Um, like this is in contrast to ordinary differential equations for autonomous ODEs, uh, we need dimension three or up, right, to get chaotic dynamics. Here, even a scalar DDE can support chaotic dynamics. And also, the solution of the DDE is uh, it gets smoother as uh, the time increases, um, except for the case of neutral delay differential equation. Uh, that, so, there's a simple argument uh, uh, why that is the case when we, for instance, there's the equation like that, right? So, uh, if you're interested, maybe you can just look at this and maybe think a little bit right? so, um, uh, why that is the case. Um, but it's a simple argument. Um, also, the eigenvectors for DDEs of linear part right, may not span the whole uh, space. Right? So, if we're uh, looking at uh, decomposition of the phase space, right, um, uh, there are cases when the eigenvectors, they may not span. Also, the characteristic equation of the DDEs uh, of the eigenvalue problems, it's transcendental rather than algebraic. For instance, just look at the right equation, right? If we take out the linear part, so uh, the linear part is just a negative x, t minus star, right? So then the eigenvalue problem becomes this. If we use the ansatz of the exponential like that, um, plugging over there, we get a transcendental equation like this for the eigenvalue beta. Right. Of course, of course, all these are classical, and he's a very nice um, uh, textbook by Jack Taylor. Um, so that talk about um, these aspects and uh, even more. So uh, that's uh, just a very uh, basic uh, short intro about uh, the DDEs. As in, um, for us, we will recast the um, DDE into an abstract form, right? Of course, that's also considered in the um, literature. So there are two approaches. One approach is we, um, working with the continuous function space. Um, so that was uh, the textbook dealing with that uh, approach. And um, because we're talking about approximations, that, um, to use uh, Hilbert space is more appropriate. So we will follow um, the approach, for instance, uh, um, using L2 function space. Um, so this approach has also been um, around for a long while. Um, one reference is a couple. Um, just to fix ideas, uh, um, I will illustrate the approach, um, the scalar DDE of this form. So it in uh, involves some discrete delays and uh, uh, distributed delay for the linear part and then the nonlinearity. Uh, it allows distributed delays as well. Um, because of the uh, technical uh, difficulties uh, to deal with the discrete delay in the nonlinearity, it's still uh, open. So, um, but so then uh, let's look at how how we recast the DDE into an abstract form. So um, it will rely on uh, auxiliary variables like the following. So. Uh, we denote x sub t to be the value of the um, state at t plus theta, right? Where theta is a variable between negative tau to zero. Tau is uh, the uh, discrete delay, right? So the maximum delay tau over there. So um, in this rec formulation, um, we can think of the theta as our spatial variable. At the end, we get a transport equation. So theta is our spatial variable, t is the time, right? Um, then there are also two parts in this segment of the solution, right? The history part or the delay part uh, where theta is between negative tau to zero with zero excluded and the current state, s for the current state um, part, which is the value x at time t, right? It's when theta equals zero. So we are at uh, the solution at time t. Uh, with these two new variables, ud and us, we can reformulate the uh, scalar DDE as the following transport equation. 
first the equation for the delay part it's just partial u over partial t equals partial u over partial theta right because uh, when you look at the formulation the t and theta uh, it they play essentially the same role right because x sub t is x t plus theta so t and theta when you differentiate of them so they're the same and we have plus over here is the uh, derivative from the right hand side because the theta is kept right at negative top so we differentiate from the right um, so the following current is for the equation for the U.S. because the U.S. equals xt, right? Then it's is uh, it's exactly the same equation as the DDE, but uh, rewritten in the new variable U.S. and U.D. Right. So the um now we have a, a it's called a transport equation, right? So we have a, the transport effect over here um for theta between negative tau and zero um but then it has a we can think of this as a boundary condition, right? For theta equals zero, so uh, it's an Highly nonlinear boundary condition over there. Uh, just a picture to uh, illustrate uh, what's going on over there. For instance, this is a trajectory of uh, the DDE solution, right? So we look at the length negative tau to zero. That's the history. Um, we uh, mapped it into the state um, of the functions where it's defined for negative tau to zero. All the functions are defined. Um, that's a state space, right? Consider the function defined on the negative tau to zero. As time evolves, this initial data is going to move. Right um, within this functions um, uh, space. Uh, now, if we look at the solution at time t, right? So that's the solution. So then the solution operator would map the initial data to the new segment red over there, right? That's the solution in the uh, transport equation. Um, so everything now is restricted from negative tau to zero as our spatial variable, right? If we introduce uh, uh, the um, variable u to be the history part and the current state, then uh, the previous system that I wrote over here can be rewritten in the following abstract ODE. Right? It's abstract ODE, linear part and nonlinear part, where linear part is just uh, um, the uh, first order derivative with, with respect to theta for theta from negative tau to zero. And at the current state, that's just the linear part of the DDE. For the nonlinearity, it's zero in the history part and uh, uh, it's uh, the nonlinearity of the DDE when theta equals zero. So that's the reformulation into an abstract ODE. Of course, then the function space for this uh, abstract ODE for the history part is just L2. Right? Current state is the Euclidean space RD. When we have a scalar DDE, then D equals one. Right? And uh, um, this Hilbert space will be endowed with uh, the natural um, product uh the cross product um product of uh, the two component right so l2 inner product for the history part and uh, just the euclidean uh inner product uh, rd part although there is a weight one over tau it's just the average uh, of the uh, integral over there right and there's also um a more regular function space we need to use because uh, the uh, linear part involves derivatives. Uh, so the domain of the linear part actually uh, is contained in the H1. So with one more degree of uh, weak derivatives in there. Um, so the domain of the linear operator uh, is a subset of uh, the um, more regular uh, product space over there under the condition where the um, when we look at the history part of the element and the thin theta to zero, right? When we approach the right end point, it matches with the current state of uh, the element in V. So why that is the case? Because uh, um, this is a H1 function space, right? Dep defined on a one dimensional segment over there. Then um, we know all the function defined over there, it's absolutely continuous, right? So then naturally there is this, um, a continuity argument. Right? So if we want uh, elements in the domain of the linear operator, uh, this condition has to be satisfied. Uh, this is very important. Um, actually, uh, it's also because of this constraint, um, some traditional orthogonal polynomials uh, uh, may not be so convenient when we um, use to construct the Galerkin approximations. And uh, that's why I introduced uh, uh, now the polynomials we will use 
It's called a Kuinder polynomial. It's not us who cooked up this. Uh, it, it goes back to a paper by Kuinder in 1984. Uh, he was exactly talking about this type of uh, uh, polynomials uh, um, orthogonal under different uh, uh, inner product. So let's see um, why why we uh, use Kuinder polynomial instead of uh, some traditional, for instance, Legend polynomial. Uh, for instance, if we use the uh, uh, Legend polynomial, then uh, this polynomial basis uh, do not live in the domain of the A because exactly because of uh, the constraint I mentioned before, um, like the history, for instance, Legend, then it will have a two part rate. So for the delay part, we, uh, uh, we will use the Legend to span the history part, but then the current state will be zero. Uh, then there's another part, uh, the history part is zero, then the current state will be just one if we look at the um, scalar. DDE case. So for all these basis function, we look at the limit. The limit when we approach to the right endpoint does not equal to the right endpoint itself. Um, because this, this is a discontinuity over there in the basis function. Um, then when we use this to uh, construct the Lerkin approximations, there will be direct delta appearing uh, in the approximation. And that uh, would cr create some technical complications uh, to get the convergence result. Uh, then it's natural to ask the question, can we find an orthon uh, orthonormal basis uh, um, that stays in the domain of the linear operator, right? And the answer is yes. And uh, uh, the starting point is to look at the inner product itself. It involves uh, L2 part, then also a part of the current state, right? So this is just a um, Euclidean inner product. Then essentially we're looking at um, for polynomials defined on negative tau to zero, that is orthogonal with the following measure. So this is just the um, average uh, Lebig measure, right? So with an average one over tau over there, then there's a, a direct delta attached to the right endpoint, right? So then we're looking for polynomials orthogonal under this new weight. Or measure over there. And it turns out Kuinder considered exactly this problem and actually considered more uh, like here allows a, um, a direct delta on the left endpoint and the right endpoint. Right. Of course, without uh, this uh, direct delta, then we go back to the Jacobian type of a, uh, weights and then we, we get uh, the classical poly uh, orthogonal polynomials. Um, Although this paper, it has been out for like around four decades, it has never been used in the DD context for some reason. Um, so then um, for his general setting, if we choose particular parameters, uh, then we end up with the Kuinder polynomials uh, that we uh, in, uh, we need in our, our setting to get the orthogonality under the uh, measure over here. Um, it turns out the Kuinder polynomials itself can be expressed uh, uh, in the following form in terms of uh, the legend itself. Here, I, I'm just considering uh, on the um, the classical case where people consider polynomials uh, on the interval negative one to the, uh, one, then we, we can, uh, for the DDE case, we can just do a linear transformation back to negative tau to zero, right? Um, so this polynomials, uh, it has exactly the orthogonality properties under uh, the um, measure over there. Um, and also it can be re-expressed uh, in terms of a linear combination of uh, the legend polynomials. It has a normalization and property uh, Kn at one. This is the right endpoint uh, of the interval. It equals one for all ends. And um, they form an orthogonal basis um, for the product space L2 cross R uh, in the one dimensional. Um, and the norm of the Kn is given like that. So uh, everything is analytic over here. Um, to prove it, uh, we just need to uh, use um, classical properties of the Legend polynomials. So nothing uh, deep over there. So uh, it's really just the new way of looking for orthogonal polynomials under new um, inner product. Um, that is useful for our perspective. Uh, and as, as I said, we can rescale the um, Coinder polynomials on, on to the interval negative tau to zero. Uh, and and uh, so for the rescaled and also the original one, right? Oops, sorry. Um, the um, 
satisfy some interesting um, properties uh, that will be used in uh, getting the convergence results uh, for the corresponding Galerian approximations. Uh, so, for instance, uh, when we sum up all these uh, bases, uh, right, um, normalized uh, divided by the uh, uh, norm squared of uh, the um, basis functions themselves, uh, when we look at the, at the theta equals zero, that's the right endpoint, right? Um, they sum up to one, this basis function. But when we look at the normalized uh, basis function summation over the um, uh, history interval negative tau to zero, they sum up to zero in the L2 sense. So on the right end point is sum up to one, but uh, over the uh, interval sum up to zero. And uh, if we look at the um, projection over a given L2 function, right, along um, all this basis function, uh, when we look at uh, the summation, again, um, the sum, uh, uh, this time, it sum up to zero, at the right end point, uh, but they sum up back to the original function over the interval, right? So it's kind of a duality uh, over here. Um, and of course, the proof is uh, quite straightforward if, um, just to make use of a uh, uh, pick up any function psi uh, in the um, product space, right? So uh, L2 cross R. Um, because uh, the basis, uh, the K and tau, this form uh, an orthogonal basis, uh, then we have the expansion giving the original element of psi has an expansion like that, right? Then we pick up a particular element. When the history is zero, the current state is one, and plugging over there, we can get the first two identities over there. If we pick up psi equals f zero, where f is an L2 function, then we get the third and the fourth elements over there. Um, this lemma um, turns out to be the key to get convergence uh, um, uh, of the Galerkin formula. And uh, I will mention a little bit more later on. Um, but uh, just uh, a numerical numerical illustration uh, of the summation, the first two uh, identity over there, right? For instance, uh, if we take up the summation of the first 20, we get the blue curves that uh, we see um, oscillating around zero in the history and it's shooting all the way up to uh, one over there. Right? And when n equals, 60, it's get better approximations. Of course, when we increase the aim, the approximation will get better and better. Um, so that's uh, the Coender uh, polynomials. Now um, we use that to um, build up Galerkin approximations uh, um, and to analyze uh, the corresponding convergence. It turns out uh, there's a, a general result we can state. Um, it, it's independent of uh, the uh, Galerkin approximations of the DDEs. So just to prepare a little bit. Um, so we consider nonlinear ODEs in Hilbert space, right? We have a linear part and nonlinear part where U lives in some uh, given Hilbert space. It could be finite dimensional, then we end up with a finite dimensional ODE. That if it's infinite dimensional, for instance, the recasted um, uh, DDE will be of this form. Right, with x to be the cross product we picked up um, before. And uh, we assume uh, the linear part generates a C0 semigroup. Uh, uh, well, um, since I don't have time to uh, go through what is a C0 semigroup, we can think of a, for instance, um, just uh, if it's in the ODE case, right, then uh, the L will be a matrix. It would gen uh, the corresponding uh, solution for the linear part, it will be e to the at, right? Um, the solution operator, and that is a, a C0 semigroup, and actually it's stronger than C0 semigroup. Um, um, but uh, in the infinite dimensional case, for instance, you take uh, the head equation, it will generate a, a C0 semigroup over there for the solution operator. And uh, at, um, for C0 semigroup, uh, um, which we denote e to the lt, right, the norm, satisfy our nat natural um, bounds m times e to the omega t. Um, for instance, in the, uh, the matrix case, uh, um, the omega, will, we can pick up any value that is bigger than the largest eigenvalue of the L, then this um, inequality will be satisfied, right? And then we're seeing we have a sequence of subspaces of the x, 
uh, um, and uh, the size of this uh, um, subspace is increases uh, to infinity and we have the following identity uh, to hold where pi n is a projection onto the subspaces, right? When we increase n, it converges to x, uh, the identity matrix um, itself, pointwise for all x, right? So um, it just says that uh, the uh, subspace will span the whole, sub, uh, the whole space x when we increase n to infinity. Right. And then we uh, we can project the original problem onto these subspaces uh, to get the Galerkin approximations uh, where u n would be just as a projection of the u onto the x n. Right. So uh, we end up with ODE finite dimensional ODE systems. And the question is uh, um, how to get the convergence of the u n to u. Right. And the theorem, the following theorem says the following. Um, so if we have the following three uh, assumptions then we would, will have a convergence. The first assumption is like the uh, linear flow associated with the semi-group associated with the Galerkin approximation, right? Um, also satisfy the uniform bond that I showed before where the L itself has this bond, right? So uh, we're seeing the Galerkin approximations as the same bond with the same M and the same omega for all N. Uh, and also uh, the linear operator for the Galerkin converges to the linear operator of uh, the original problem pointwise in the following sense. And assume the nonlinearity is globally nipshits. Then um, the, uh, for any initial data, there is a mild solution to the original abstract ODE. And also the Galerkin approximations converges to the um, original solution um, and this um, convergence is uniform over any given finite time interval, zero to t. So you get um, uniform convergence. Uh, the, the proof, um, it's quite standard. It's based on the trotter cato theorem, um, um, plus some semi-group theories and ground y inequality to handle the nonlinearity. Um, by the way, the trotter cato theorem, you can think of it just a, an analog of the lax richmere equivalent theorem um, in the context of semi-groups. Uh, so, um, it's over here, the assumption one and assumption two. So uh, the first one you can think of it as a stability um, uh, type of uh, estimate. Right? And the second one is the consistency. The uh, uh, approximation has to be consistent with uh, the original linear operator uh, in, in the sense over here. Then we get the uniform convergence. And we can apply uh, this scheme to the Galerkin approximations of the nonlinear DDEs, right? So whereas the basis would be just uh, the Quinder basis uh, and the projection, we can write down, um, the projection is of this form, right? So, but we can reorganize it into some operators acting on the delay part and the current state part, right? Where the PN, QN, PN prime, QN prime are written in this form. You know, it's a very busy slide, right? But uh, essentially when you look at the um, terms uh, appearing over here, they look precisely like, the four terms in the lemma I showed you before. Um, so that's where the le lemma is going to uh, get um, to, uh, to play a key role to get uh, the convergence of these terms uh, to verify their assumptions, uh, A1, A2, A, A, um, A1 and A2 over there. Um, uh, of course, without going into details, uh, right? So um, uh, essentially, the um, all the, these terms, right? So it boils down just using the definition and the um, the lemma. Um, we will we'll, we'll get uh, uh, the desired convergence given over here. Uh, A1, which is uh, like the stability and A2 is a convergence, uh, consistence. Right? So uh, it's just uh, um, by using uh, direct definition and the lemma we'll get it without um, going into details. Um, of course, uh, I can talk, uh, come back if uh, people are interested, um, but for the sake of time, um, let me just uh, um, say that the key, uh, the key to, to uh, achieve this um, uh, um, convergence results uh, to uh, verify the uh, conditions uh, is just because of the use of the polynomials. Um, which give us access to the nice lemmas and uh, it appears in um, verifying quantities appearing in the proof. And, and because it lives in the domain of A, um, 
and they enjoy some useful identities. Uh, so we avoid direct delta in the Galerkin approximations. Um, um, and so that, that, that at the end, uh, it becomes uh, just a simple um, algebraic manip manipulations um, uh, to get uh, the desired uh, conditions to satisfy. Of course, the global Nipschitz condition on F is quite restricted. Um, we also have a other relaxed form. Um, so for instance, uh, uh, assume if F is locally Nipschitz, um, and additionally, if it, is sat it satisfies an energy inequality of this form, then we can still apply the result uh, to get the convergence. And also, if um, this energy um, inequality uh, is replaced by some sublinear growth condition, we can also get a convergence result. Um, so that's uh, the um, theoretical part. Uh, of course, then how does the, the analytic implementation of the Galerkin approximation look like? Um, well, uh, it turns out we can get uh, and an illegal formula as, uh, as well. Um, so um, the, um, of course, in the um, in that procedure, um, because we have uh, the transport equation part, right? So it involves the derivative with respect to theta. So we need to re-express the Kuhnder polynomials, the derivative of the Kuhnder polynomials in terms of the Kuhnder polynomials itself. These coefficients, we need to find it, right? And to find this coefficient, uh, it turns out we need to solve uh, just an upper triangular system of linear equations of this form where uh, the matrix T um, has uh, elements given like this and the right-hand side has elements given like that, right? So just solve this upper triangular system so we get the coefficients um, for the derivative over there. Then uh, if we take, then what's left is just classical, take the expansion of the um, approximation under the Kuhnder basis, raise the corresponding coefficients Y and uh, will satisfy an uh, n-dimensional ODE system of this form where the linear part is given like that and non-linearity is given like that. Um, so uh, what's uh, interesting about this approximation is like when we look at the delay parameter tau, they appear as a, just a um, coefficient some of the, uh, in some of the um, uh, elements in the matrix. Right? <clears throat> And the uh, the a and k are those coming from the uh, derivative of the basis function. So that's uh, the ODE system. So it's n-dimensional ODE approximation where we have a uh, analytic formulas uh, for all the constituted uh, uh, constituted terms, uh, uh, except that the a and k we need to solve an upper triangular algebraic system. That, that's it. Then um, with that, I will move on to some numerical illustrations uh, of the, <clears throat> the quantity of the Galerkin approximations uh, just to the you know, DDE dynamics. For instance, uh, here, um, the example of the Suarez shop, uh, DDE, um, <clears throat> um, we, we were here, we were showing uh, just a, a six dimensional ODE approximations compared to the DDE itself. It's already recovering, recovering essentially all the dynamics over there for the choosing parameter regime. And for this um, DDE, when we move the tau, it has actually a half of bifurcation appearing. So that I showed over here. Um, when tau crosses some threshold, it close to 1.74. So this is a subcritical half bifurcation uh, coming out. And actually, the six-dimensional OD, ODE approximations capture exactly this um, um, uh, sub hop verification. So below the tau, critical tau, so tau C is 1.74, right? So if we are here, then we will have a, um, one unstable limit cycle and then one stable limit cycle, right? So 1.6, so um, the ODE system captures them very well this um, um, limit cycles, both unstable and stable ones. And when we move on and cross the bifurcation parameter 1.75, there's only one stable limit cycle. Um, and also in terms of chaotic dynamics, so for instance, here when tau is zero, we get the, it's just a, the um, normal form of a, a pitchfork bifurcation, right? But when we increase the tau, we can get chaotic dynamics when tau is sufficiently large. So the left hand side is the attractor uh, in the, um, 
delay coordinate x t minus tau compared to x t, right? So um, it has this uh, chaotic dynamics and uh, um, the lurking uh, again, just to use six dimensional reproduce the, all the essential chaotic dynamics in the system. And uh, not only that, right? So um, actually for delay differential equations, uh, we can have systems uh, that, well, a, a scalar DDE like that can uh, give a uh, nearly brown motion like chaotic dynamics. See here, uh, the black is the um, two DDE dynamics. So it looks pretty random, right? And um, there's a 10 dimensional Galerkin approximations. Of course, because it's chaotic, um, we should not expect uh, the project, the match trajectory wise. Right? So here I show it just to show the um, Brownian like dynamics over there. Instead, um, to assess the uh, quantity of the approximations, we should look at the statistics. Uh, here uh, we show a plot at the relatively large, tau, uh, large time t, uh, time instant, right? So when we look at the time instant, if we initialize with uh, multiple um, random initial data, we should, uh, when we look at the fixed time <clears throat> t, the statistics should look Gaussian. Right, uh, if it's brown emotion and uh, the variance should scale like t to the uh, 0. 0.5. Right? So that's the variance uh, a formula for the um, brown emotion. And here uh, the top panel is from the DDE, so we get 0. 0.479. Right? So, um, not not too too far from 0. 0.5. Right, so it's close to um, brown emotion type of a uh, uh, scanning that we would expect. And for the uh, Galerkin approximations, uh, we get 0.48, so pretty close. Um, of course, uh, so these are just uh, some proof of concept, right? Because we already get the convergence uh, uh, results. Then it's expected that we, we um, when the dimension of the Galerkin is high enough, we should have uh, this type of uh, uh, approximation quantity. Right. Then uh, what can we do with uh, these uh, ODE systems? Right. So um, in the next uh, uh, maybe 20 minutes, I'd like to go through briefly um, two um, type of uh, approximations. The uh, first is to characterize bifurcations in the delay differential equations. Uh, and uh, the next uh, will be uh, using um, uh, at, when adding noise uh, to get a chaos out of it. Right. So first, uh, um, the bifurcation characterization. This um, uh, is coming from a chaos paper published uh, three years ago. Um, of course, um, I, before I jump into it, I should say um, for if we just uh, interested in uh, get uh, the bifurcation diagram, then there are um, tools, um, um, <clears throat> numerical software so we can use, right? For instance, a DDE buffer tool. Um, we can use to get the bifurcation diagram um, when the system only involves discrete delay. But for distri distributed delays, uh, there's uh, still not no um, available software tools uh, to analyze it. Uh, so here, um, because of the Galerkin approximations, uh, we get ODE systems. So we can use the standard uh, uh, ODE bifurcation tools to analyze it. And also we have analytic formulas of the system. Um, so uh, the characterization will be just uh, you know, following the classical bifurcation um, presentation for ODE systems, since now we, we're in this setting of uh, um, ODEs for the galerkin coinder approximations. Um, for Hopf bifurcation, for instance, uh, our theme, um, the system has a, a scalar parameter uh, and the system has a C1 smoothness dependence. Uh, for the problem over here, we can think of lambda as our delay parameter tau. Um, and there's a critical value, lambda C, where the eigenvalue for the linear path, um, so the first pair crosses uh, the imaginary uh, axis, right? So it's the first pair sits right on the imaginary axis uh, while the remaining eigenvalues uh, stay on the left half plane. Uh, and also when we further increase tau or, or decrease tau rates, so depending on which direction the bifurcation happens, the uh, first pair has to cross the imaginary axis, meaning that the derivative with respect to lambda is not zero. Um, so that's uh, the uh, standard setup uh, for Hopf bifurcation. Here's a picture of it. Uh, so this is the first pair uh, as tau uh, increases, right? So this is um, the vertical line marks the critical um, 
a parameter. So before the critical parameter, the first pair, the real part is negative, and after it becomes positive, right? So there's a critical crossing, and all the other eigen um, values stay on the left half plane, right? Although when uh, the parameter increases, uh, the second pair, right? So it moves uh, closer to, um, but there is always a gap uh, in between and the first pair and the remaining eigen um, pairs. Um, the um, assumption on the nonlinearity, assume if we take a Taylor expansion, right? So it has a second order term, third order, and the higher order terms. Um, and also, there are some technical assumptions uh, uh, regarding uh, the eigenvalues. Um, these are also classical, um, right? Uh, so when the corresponding nonlinear interactions of the eigen um, vectors going through the second order polynomial, um, uh, second order, uh, Taylor approximations, uh, if the corresponding uh, interaction is not zero, then the corresponding eigenvalues, the combination of that should not be zero. Essentially, the, um, um, without going into details, uh, uh, this type of assumptions uh, uh, ensure that we are not dividing by zero when we um, um, <clears throat> derive the corresponding normal form approximations of bifurcation. If these assumptions are satisfied, then the original n-dimensional Gerlachian system can be reduced to just uh, um, the following normal form. It's called Stuart Nanda normal form. It's just a, a one-dimensional ODE where the state variable Z, of course, is complex valued. If we think about a real value, it means two-dimensional, right? Real part and imaginary part. Um, so it's two-dimensional um, uh, center manifold reduce the system like that. And the type of uh, the bifurcation, bifurcated uh, um, exams is a half bifurcation, and the type of half bifurcation, whether it's stable or unstable, is determined by the sign of the real part of the CN, which we call LN1. It's the real part of the, the cubic uh, coefficients over there. So it's subcritical if this is positive. And it's supercritical if this is negative. Subcritical meaning that the bifurcated periodic orbits is unstable, and supercritical it's stable. Right. So <clears throat> um, there's a reduction procedure going on, right? So behind the assumptions, uh, um, once we reduce it, uh, we get uh, um, the um, two-dimensional system in real var um, variables, right? So that ca captures fully the dynamic behavior. And this coefficients, of course, uh, the CN becomes crucial, right? Because the, the sign of the, its real part determines the type of application um, as determined through the nonlinearity and the uh, system coefficients. Uh, that's where you see uh, the um, eigenvalues coming into play. That's why we require it does not vanish when the corresponding nonlinear interaction is not zero. Right. Um, the, so that's uh, the formula. Uh, everything is classical, as I said, right? So uh, that's the key. Uh, that's the main point, right? See, so, uh, you do Gerlachian approximations and uh, everything becomes ODEs, and then you can apply ODE techniques um, to analyze the application. Um, just an application to the crowd, <clears throat> to uh, the um, a concrete DDE, it's called um, a Cloud Rain Scalar DDE. So, um, this is a model a colleague, um, um, the, one of the co authors, uh, Elon Corin, and his uh, collaborators uh, analyzed it. No. <clears throat> to uh, um, model uh, as a, as a um, minimalistic uh, uh, model of all the uh, uh, cloud dynamics. So where H is the height of the cloud, and if we don't look at the second term, right, so here the linear term, essentially there's a saturation effect for the cloud height to reach some maximum height. But then this is uh, uh, the effect of the rain, right? When it rains, the, the height of the cloud reduces, and the, this is controlled by the nonlinearity over here. And there's a delay involved uh, so, um, to um, take into account some microphysics uh, processes. Uh, if we normalize it, uh, so we get the following uh, non dimensionalized uh, uh, system. So <clears throat> with the parameters, where tau is a delay. And if we move the tau, uh, of course, uh, then there's a for the system. So there's a um, steady state, right? The physical steady state, which is positive, uh, given like that. And if we um, do perturbation around this uh, um, steady state, right, we get a system like this. 
and then we can do caloric approximation um, for the new DDEs uh, and the getter system, exactly like what we had before uh, with the co coefficients determined. Then we can calculate the corresponding um, near north coefficients, which is a real part of the uh, cubic coefficients, right? So as we increase the dimension, you see it's stable, stabilized to a negative value pretty quickly. After six dimension of the Galactic approximation, you see the value is essentially not changing, uh, indicating there's a supercritical hop bifurcation occurring in the system. Of course, we can look at it. Um, uh, like when we integrate um, the uh, DDE itself, which is a black, and uh, the uh, center manifold reduction, the two dimensional center manifold reduction, which is a red. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, as we can see, when we move away from the criticality, right, the amplitude increases, uh, but we get closer, the amplitude gets smaller. So that matches with uh, the um, supercritical scenario. Uh, of course, this is another um, uh, result uh, is like uh, just uh, to do two dimensional crude truncation, we don't um, uh, do center manifold reduction, right? So it's just like a two dimensional Galerkin approximations of the original system. Um, uh, then the results is less good. Um, and also in terms of dynamics, right? So here is a visualization of the two dimensional manifold. Uh, so where the asymptotic dynamics, uh, the black and DDE solution seats. Right, so if we start from away from the center manifold, right, then it's gonna, um, there's some transient oscillations and eventually it settles down to the center manifold, um, just for the dynamics uh, showing the, in this example. <clears throat> and with that, of course, uh, for the um, bifurcation, we can use that to analyze the other type of bifurcation. Here is just an illustration for uh, the um, <clears throat> hopper bifurcation case. And in the remaining about eight, nine minutes, I so just um, talk a little bit about the noise driven chaos out of periodic dynamics. Of course, like for DDEs, uh, so it's easy to get a periodic dynamics, uh, very uh, smooth. Uh, so, um, and it can also support chaotic dynamic, dynamics. Uh, but um, um, how do we use the uh, DDE dynamics? We tweak it right to to match more um, time series oscillations that we observe from reality. Right, so that's uh, the motivation of uh, this part. If we can add a noise to um, uh, make the solution behave um, closer to the time series we observe in reality or from high end simulations. So this part is based on our, uh, results published uh, last year in Science Advance. <clears throat> the starting point is uh, the following Stuart Landau normal form that we saw previously, right? So I kept just the cubic term, uh, the first two terms. Um, and it turns out if the ratio over here, the imaginary part of the cubic term and the real part of the cubic term, right? So it's called the twist number. If this twist number is large enough, then by simply adding a white noise over there, we can get chaotic dynamics. And let me just show you, uh, hopefully it will show. Um, so here it's just, I choose random initial data, right? And I have two um, dots, red and blue. So it's just uh, the uh, two initial data. As time evolves, they, they will um, uh, show the corresponding solution trajectory, right? So you see quickly um, after the, uh, initialization. So we see a chaotic uh, uh, attractor emerging um, and you will always see this uh, uh, stretch and twist and bending effects over there, right? It's um, um, in the literature, it's called a shear reduced, shear induced chaos. Um, and here <clears throat> we have uh, the two uh, trajectories. Initially they stay close to each other, right? Eventually they deviate. Because, um, um, just to show the dynamics uh, uh, is chaotic in the time um, then uh, time series level. And that's uh, the attractor uh, at, uh, as time evolved. By just adding a noise with sufficiently large uh, um, uh, noise strength, right, we can get chaos out of a pure. If we turn off the noise over here, it's just periodic dynamics, right? So the key is that the ratio over here, the trace number should be large enough. Of course, these are classical results and uh, it's being well analyzed uh, 
uh, in the literature and the people knows uh, what's really behind it is called a uh, 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 mechanism um, due to isochrome. Um, what is isochrome? Um, it's uh, <clears throat> essentially the stable manifold of uh, the uh, any uh, when we look at the periodic orbit, right? So pick up at any point on the periodic orbit, uh, we calculate the stable manifold uh, along this point. Then that that is isochrome. Or dynamic dynamically, you can think of uh, um, the isochrome for associated with the point x zero is the collection of all the initial data when we evolve the system. They uh, converge to the um, uh, solution on starting from x zero. So essentially, they share the same asymptotic phase, right? the phase equivalent to initial conditions. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the picture over here, for instance, so that's the periodic orbit, right? So you pick up x0 there, then the blue curve across the uh, periodic orbit is the, the corresponding isochrome, right? And I, I shoot two pictures over here. One is with a smaller twist number, right? Another is with a bigger twist number. You see uh, the isochrome is more bended uh, when the twist number is larger. So the, uh, intuitively, when we add noise to it, uh, so the one with more bend is easier to to get become chaotic because uh, like uh, when they are close to each other, when we do uh, noise perturbations, uh, then they have higher tendency to move away from each other when we have a, a larger bend. And this larger bend, uh, larger twist number translate to a bigger bend can also be uh, view, uh, can be seen through the um, polar coordinates reformulation of the previous, because in the theta, the derivative of theta, the, the twist number appear over there, right? And then how, how do we uh, design a noise to enhance twist when the twist, uh, enhance the chaos, when the twist is not enough, large enough, right? So that's the case. We need to, to introduce uh, exactly some effects um, in the cubic term to increase periodic, um, like um, randomly this trace number. If we add a term to the equation like this, with the cubic, right, with the imaginary part, remember in the trace number, the imaginary part appear in the top, right? So if we could uh, introduce a D positive right over there and uh, where F, for instance, it could be just a, a random kick like that, uh, taking value zero and one. Right. So we randomly increase the, the twist and add white noise uh, also to there, then we can get um, chaos out of it for any normal form, right? No, regardless of the previous uh, twist number in the original system, because we can choose the D large enough, then we always get chaos out of it. Um, that's at the normal form level, right? But then if we take that normal form and go back to the original uh, delay differential equation in the transport equation form, the noise we add at the normal form level actually translate into a noise of this form at the transport equation level, where it has a state dependent part coming from here, right? The Z, we can think of the projection of uh, the true solution onto the first eigen uh, vector, right? So you, um, that's where the uh, inner product of the U with the first eigen vector comes in, and plus the complex conjugate. And the um, boundary condition, the nonlinear boundary condition stays the same as the DDE. So the noise is added to that, right? Of course, um, uh, if we work directly at the DDE level, um, we can never imagine like um, this type of noise added to it. So by analyzing the reduced equation, um, it motivates us to look at this. And of course, uh, then if we add the noise, um, this is the dynamics at the DDE level, we get exactly the same type of uh, uh, stretch and bend like we see before in the normal form level, right? So let me just speed up it. You see um, the stretch and the fold dynamics appearing. Right. Let me stop that. So um, that's the chaos we get out of the, um, if we turn off the noise, we just get uh, periodic dynamics. And of course, um, uh, then why it's important, right, to get this uh, state dependent part, uh, as we know, I explained, right, so this is there to en enhance the twist number. What if we don't get the, um, uh, say we remove this state dependence, we just uh, 
right? The state dependency comes in from this inner you know, product. If we don't have this, just to multiply with the phi one, where phi one is the first eigenvector, um, then we get the key, we still get chaos, but the chaos is look like this. There's no stretch and bending effects anymore. It looks more like a diffusive effect where if we put a um, like a red um, marker uh, in some region, right? We look at the evolution of the red uh, <clears throat> points becomes a very dis diffusive um, as at a later time. And compared to here, it's more like uh, um, less diffusive. Uh, instead, it's kind of a reminiscent of uh, uh, passive tracers uh, in turbulent uh, flows. And this uh, maps out uh, the um, structure of the attractors uh, in the flow. Um, then, uh, of course, all these are just based on dynamic uh, interpretations and motivations. Uh, so, uh, what's the potential link to applications? And here's just one um, uh, uh, example. So, here um, the um, black curve over here is for um, large dimensional um, simulation of uh, the uh, cloud model. So, using large edge simulations, uh, so we get the um, corresponding vertical velocity of the uh, cloud dynamics from the back uh, and black. And the red curve is coming from the noise driven chaos um, that we uh, included the state dependent noise into the times uh, into the model um, in, the, in the transport equation and get the time series over here. Um, so visually, they look reminiscent. And if we turn off the noise into the uh, transport equation, we just get the blue curve over here. It's just um, and periodic dynamics. And in terms of uh, like a more statistical, uh, the, the black curve uh, has a, like a bimodal behavior over there. And uh, when we compute the power spectrum of the red, it actually shows up with um, the second bump over there as well. Right? <clears throat> so it gives us uh, uh, some confidence about moving forward uh, to, to uh, uh, using this approach to capture um, some more, to enhance the dynamic behavior in the delay differential equation model. And of course, uh, so what I showed you before, all of these are just uh, um, time series, right? Because um, there's no spatial dependence over there. Um, and in cloud evolution, we, if we look at the, um, it should be either two-dimensional or three-dimensional in space. Uh, um, and uh, we're looking, working into that direction, um, actually motivated for the uh, uh, reduction procedure. We came up with a partial differential equation system um, that can get some of the, uh, that gives patterns uh, reminiscent to the observations we get. For instance, the panel A and C are cloud patterns from observations, and B and D are patterns we get out of this uh, um, PDE system. Of course, it's a new type of PDE and we're still doing, um, we're still working on it. Uh, so that's why I even didn't write down the uh, PDE here. Um, but just to uh, summarize, uh, so we have a, a explored a new way to get a Galerkin approximations of the delay differential equations. Uh, it has analytic formulas. Uh, we can get the uh, theoretical convergence and uh, the corresponding the lurking system, it's ODE, right? So finite dimensional. So we can use that to do bifurcation analysis, optimal controls, and stochastic modeling uh, out of it. Uh, um, the, so you can get uh, some motivations uh, from these uh, low dimensional systems and uh, to motivate uh, how to modify the original system um, to get more realistic dynamics. Of course, uh, um, going beyond that, there are still many open work um, in questions, uh, for instance, how do we deal with neutral delay differential equations, uh, uh, rigorous proof of the bifurcation results, and also um, so how do we introduce stochastic forcing um, to better suit uh, physical needs? Right. So these are just some type of questions. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and here are some references. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu, for this nice um, and interesting talk. And um, I think let's hear some comments or questions from the audience. Maybe I, I can start, there's no yeah. one. 
<laughs> this was uh, thank you, Honko. This was very nice, very clear. Uh, I, I as always, I'm, I'm learning a lot from from your talks. It's always something new with you. So, um, <laughs> so let, let me just. So maybe can we? Can you? I have I have several questions, but maybe I can ask a simple one, uh, clarifying. So can you, if you go back one slide, maybe when you like summarize the. Uh, uh, so I just yeah no 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 yeah so the second to last um, um, bullet you say how to rigorously prove the bifurcation results from high dimensional um, you said the spectral pollution issues so what issues what do you mean by that so like can you um, like yes of... yes yeah yeah so uh, of course uh, like uh, when we look at the the Haiti equation for instance uh, look at the uh, um, spectral uh, Galerkian approximation of the heat equation, right? So we see the eigenvalues uh, converging nicely to the eigenvalues uh, of uh, the Laplace operator, right? As we increase the dimension, this is no less, no more, right? So n dimensional approximate the first n eigenvalues of uh, the Laplace operator, right? But here, for the delay differential equations, uh, it, it's different. Uh, and in general, actually, for general operators, uh, one should also expect, one should not expect, so for instance, is that we have n-dimensional Galerkian approximation, look at the linear part, right, consider the eigenvalue problem. Then we get n eigenvalues out, and these n eigenvalues, uh, they may, not all of them are approximating the eigenvalues of the original linear operator. So there are some spurious ones. That's what we call uh, spectral pollution. Uh, so there, there are uh, eigenvalues uh, in the Galerkian system that has nothing to do with the eigenvalues in the original system. It's very interesting, and actually, so there, uh, uh, there are uh, um, quite a lot of uh, investigations, and actually, there are textbook uh, talking about the, the spectrum pollution issues uh, um, for different uh, type of uh, operators. Um, so, and it turns out. To be the case here for the yeah. Quinder polynomial approximations of the DDEs, uh, we do see uh, spurious uh, um, eigenvalues coming out. Um, so that complicates, uh, of course, uh, when we increase dimension, these spurious eigenvalues, uh, they tend to um, be pushed away from the uh -huh. real uh, um, axis, right? So meaning that the frequency gets higher and higher. Um, so, but um, how to handle these uh, spurious um, um, eigenvectors uh, turns out to be not so difficult. At least we don't see how to do it uh, for the bifurcation analysis. Of course, uh, uh, because the Galerkian system, the convergence I showed you before, for the uh, convergence of the solution, uh, we don't deal with uh, this issue, right? There's no eigenvalue decomposition over there. So there's no issue uh, uh, in that perspective. It's more like when we consider verification results. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. um, I would like to ask one, maybe it will be so simple. Uh, but could you just uh, do a little bit more, more comment about choosing the del delay uh, parameter? Because um, in one slide, you just show for the different delay parameter, how the, the figure is getting different. And do we need to look at the bifur uh, bifurcation? This is yes, the point. Uh, for instance, over here. So here is just, a, uh, this is already passed to the bifurcation. Let me show you maybe uh, one slide. Um... Over here. Um, so to pinpoint this um, uh, critical parameter tau, so we just need to look at the linear part of uh, the Galerkian approximation. Look at the, how the eigenvalues evolve as the tau changes. Then, because remember, there should be a critical crossing, right? We're looking at the, the critical value would be the one that the eigenvalue, the real part of the leading eigenvalue hits the imaginary axis. So that's where the critical. Uh, that's how we identify the critical um, parameter tau, uh, right? Then we can choose if we want to look at the dynamics before the critical value or after the critical value. So the, the uh, figure I showed you over here is already past uh, the uh, critical value. I see. Um, tau C. Yeah, as, uh, here I just want to see as we increase uh, away from the um, critical value, right? How the 
approximation is still doing its job. Of course, you see uh, deviates as we move further. Uh, so this is expected because uh, the, in the um, approximation, we truncated, right? So we um, keep holding the second, uh, the first and the third order. We don't have the higher order terms in it. Uh, and there's another part I didn't uh, mention is, uh, because this is a dimension, right? So we have a high dimensional Gherkin system um, projected on to uh, the central manifold. And I didn't mention what is a central manifold because I don't have time. Um, so this projection is usually it's valid only locally, right? When the dynamics is around and near the origin. Uh, here it's uh, shifted. So um, when we added the, the trivial steady states, that's why it's not centered around zero. Mm -hmm. But when we move away, the dynamics get bigger, right? As in, um, the manifold itself may not be valid. Um, but here we were interested in characterizing the type of uh, uh, verifications, right? So then, then um, it's uh, near the critical value um, that we're doing the analysis. I see. Thank you so much again. And um, if we do not have further questions and comment, let's thank Dr. Lee one more time for his talk and um, see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.